the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, you told us uh, that those who feed you, feed the poor, give drink to the thirsty, and visit the prison are doing this out of love for you. So Lord, we talk about this special ministry that so often is not talked about, that the church has give, that's given us, of being able to minister to those who are imprisoned. We ask, Lord, that uh, we see the dignity in every human person, and that we seek the conversion of all. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father. Good morning. Welcome to anybody who is <clears throat> not normally joining us for Faith Filled Coffee. My name is Therese Keg, and I'm part of the discipleship team here at St. Francis of Assisi. And on behalf of the entire team, welcome. And we're really excited to introduce our speaker this morning. Jeff Kohler was raised in St. Francis and graduated from St. Francis grade school. He's a retired accountant who for the past about 10 or so years has been involved in prison ministry. Jeff is currently a member of St. Margaret Mary, as well as St. James in Potosi, but I'm going to let you talk about that a little bit more. It's also of interest, Jeff has three sons, two of whom are here in St. Louis, but one teaches English in Seoul, South Korea, and I imagine Jeff might talk a little bit about that as well. So welcome, Jeff. We're excited to hear you talk. Well, I'm going to start out without a microphone. Can everybody hear me okay in the back? Maybe a little. Maybe you want me to grab the microphone? Okay. That's better. Okay. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity, and um, wanted to introduce myself just a little bit more. So I actually graduated from here in 1975. So this building wasn't here yet. I think it came in 1982 or something like that. So, uh, but I'm a, a proud uh, Franciscan friar from uh, from St. Francis. My, uh, well, a after that I went to uh, Vianney, graduated from there in 79. So for those wondering what all the bling is, this, uh, this is a Society of Mary so I'm very fond of the Marianists and uh, very proud of my Vianney education. And then I went to Rockhurst in Kansas City, which is Jesuit. So I've had Franciscans, Marianists, and Jesuits. So might explain some of my dysfunction. I, I don't know. Uh, in, in attendance are um, my aunt and uncle, the Pelzels. Not only are they my aunt and uncle, but they're my godparents. So uh, my parents are in this parish, Roger and Mary Fuller, and, uh, and the Pelzels have been in the parish over 60 years, right? So uh, my, my parents moved here in 1961 when I was born. So uh, it's over 60 years of, of tradition there. Uh, also got a couple of my cousins here, Joe and Denise, uh, also Pelzels. So um, I'm very grateful for my parents and helping me get through St. Francis and Vianney, and, uh, and also having great godparents. I, I really think you you set me on the on the right path and and, and helped me uh, help me get through life. And uh, I don't know how to get through life without without Jesus on your team. So uh, and, and you also taught me. Right and wrong. So one of the one of my favorite prayers on that subject, and because sometimes when you're fighting for what's right, you have to uh, take a risk, take take a challenge. And so one of my favorite prayers is the Serenity Prayer. So maybe we can all say that prayer together before we start. God, give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about Potosi Correctional Center. So that's where I do my, my prison ministry. So Potosi uh, Correctional Center is about an hour south on Highway 21. 
So I don't know if any of you have ever been to Potosi or any, anywhere near there, but it's uh, maybe an hour and 10 minutes from here if we left right now. And uh, it's Missouri's toughest prison. So it's death row and life without parole for the most part. So I always say that um, whether you're death row or life without parole, you're going to leave in a body bag, which is, is a harsh reality of, of the situation. A couple more uh, stats about the, the building and the facility. So the building was built for 400. Uh, I call them residents, they call them inmates, but I call them residents or participants. But it was built for 400 and there are 800 in there now. So it's, it's uh, you've got cells that are doubled up uh, when they shouldn't be, even solitary confinement. These guys have a, a cellmate, which makes no sense to, to put somebody who's, you know, arguably caused a problem with another guy in a six by 12 cell. It doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense. They are, uh, they are very small cells, so I, I, I get to see the cells. I, I do solitary confinement rounds also. And um, so imagine six by 12, so they can you know, barely stretch out if they're tall. It, they're a bunk bed, and um, it's, it's just, just a, kind of an awful situation, and especially in solitary where they're, where they're together in that small space. There are no uh, no fruit or vegetables there, so that's that's pretty awful. Uh, I was talking to to Ernie, uh, who turns out Ernie uh, was a neighbor of, of my parents, two houses down. So I had forgotten that, but but he reminded me that, uh, and I've seen this. I didn't have it in my notes yet, but the boxes, the food boxes that come in, they literally say not fit for human consumption. That's what the, the, their food says. So again, it gives you a little bit of a flavor for what, what, what happens there. One of the, one of the real eye-openers and harsh realities my first time in was just hearing the, the clank of the metal doors behind you. you. You go in there and, you know, you're already a little nervous. And then you, you know, you go through about three of these doors, but every one of them, boom, you know, it clanks behind you and it just kind of wakes you up and reminds you where you are. Uh, another, another item that kind of is a, a stark reality of there, there's a guard tower and it looks a little bit like a, uh, an air traffic control station. So it's, but the guys are, there are guys out there with, with rifles ready to, ready, ready to shoot anybody if, if they uh, think they need to. Um, another harsh reality, there are three fences. So there's a kind of an inner fence that, you know, is a normal fence. The one beyond that is electric fence. And I got, I guess, too close to that once because one of the guards said, if you, you touch that, you're going to die. And I said, okay. So I, I moved back. And then the, the furthest fence out is, um, a razor wire fence, so it's you know it's about 20 feet high, and to top these circles of, of razor wire, which just uh, in the sunlight it's 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 scary and beautiful at the same time. I mean, it's it's shiny and it's but again another reminder of, of where you are. All right, so I wanted to wanted to then we talked about the building and the place. Let's talk about the, the men that are in there. So these guys, uh, and don't take this as justifying what they've done, but, but they're mostly there. They committed crimes when they were very young, teenagers often, and, um, and they're often, they were often high or, or drunk when they did it. Again, no justification for, for what they did, but then they're there for, for 70 years after that. Um, one, one of the misconceptions that, that I always like to talk about, because it's in every, every prison movie you've ever seen, that they all say they're innocent, and that's not true. So most of them, most of them say, you know, I, Jeff, I did something terrible. 
I deserve to be here. I just want to be a better person. They're all poor. You know, so there, there's a saying that I like to, uh, to talk about it, and you probably have all heard this, but it's, it's better to be um, rich and guilty than poor and innocent. So the, the, these guys, you know, they get terrible pro bono lawyers, and uh, that's a real common denominator there. Um, you know, it's half black, half white, so it's it's not necessarily a, a race thing, although we can talk about that. But it is a poor thing. Poor people go to jail, rich people don't. A lot of these guys are, are dog trainers, so there's a I think it's stray rescue they work with, but but um, every time I go in there, they're in the yard. There are eight, eight or ten dogs, and they're typically pit bulls because people abandon pit bulls. And um, it's the same with stray rescue. If you go, I've adopted a dog from stray rescue, and if you adopt a dog from stray rescue, ninety percent of them are going to be pit bulls. And uh, but these these hardened guys, these tough guys are there training dogs, and these dogs love them, and they have a special connection with the dogs, so that, that's cool to see, I think. They, uh, many of them are really, really good Christians. They, uh, they, can, they can outdo me on the Bible all, all day long, uh, and you can, we can joke and talk about whether Catholics are great Bible scholars. Um, we, we, we should be, um, but, but oftentimes these guys in prison, and, and it's, you know, they've got so much time on their hands too, right? And so they can, a lot of them have practically memorized the Bible. So uh, whenever there's a, a Bible discussion, I, I, uh, I think I understand, especially the New Testament, uh, you know, I understand what Jesus was all about, and, but I'm not going to be an expert in quoting Old Testament necessarily, so but these guys can. They um, they just want many of them want to spread the word while they're in prison. So they've got they're looking for something good to do. They're looking for a way to spend their time that's valuable. And um, and if they feel like they're making an impression on other people and converting other people, that's a real calling, and they can have tons of value doing that inside the prison. They're old, they're young, they're black or they're white, a lot of diversity in, in that regard. And I think the main point here is when you hit rock bottom, which they of course have, that's when you, and it's, this is for all of us, when you, when you need Jesus most is when, when you're having trouble, right? When you, I mean, if, if all of our lives are always going great, you know, some of us still always turn to Christ, but I think it's it's easier to turn to Christ when when things are hard. And so for these guys, it's as hard as it can be. So they're they're uh, they've hit rock bottom and they've got nowhere else to go but Jesus Christ. They say um, one guy told me, Jeff, I just don't want to be angry anymore. Can you help me not be? And, and, and I think a, another point is so many of them are much different than when they committed their crimes. And again, I'm not, one thing I won't do this morning is justify um, what they've done. But they're, they're all different, they're very different now than they were 40 years ago when they were 19 years old and, and high on drugs. And now, you know, they're good Christians, and they're very remorseful, many of them, most of them. So I'm going to get into kind of the specifics about the various uh, various things that I do in there. And the, the, the main one is called kairos. So the Greeks uh, have a much better understanding of language than we do. So Greeks, there's always five or six words for every, every word in English. 
So the ministry is called Kairos, and that's a Greek word for God's time. So I want to contrast that with Kronos, which is like clock time. So um, what we mean by Kairos is that we don't know when Jesus is going to speak to these guys and help these guys. But we do know um, it'll be on, on the Holy Spirit in God's, God's time, Kairos time. And, you know, contrast that with Kronos. So the, the good example I always like to say is, you know, when, uh, when a lady is pregnant and going to deliver, the doctor will say, you know, you're going to deliver um, April 5th at, at 10 o'clock. And, and that's, that's Kronos time. So if on April 1st, she tells her husband, I'm having a baby, the husband can't say, no, you, you're not having a baby. You're, you're having the baby on April 5th at, at 10 o'clock. So having a baby is Kairos. It's, it's going to come when God decides it's going to come. It's not necessarily going to come uh, on April 5th at, at 10 a.m. Unless you're having a C-section, I guess. <laughs> or being induced. So we have a team of Kairos. It's a non-denominational team. So, and that's, that's been good for me because I, I've been Catholic, I love being Catholic, been Catholic my whole life, couldn't live without Mary and the saints and transubstantiation. But I do get to work with Baptists and Methodists and, and that's been good for me because it, I, every Christian's heart is in the right place. So it's been good for me to kind of uh, be with other good Christians. That's not going to change who I am. I, I love love being Catholic. But uh, it is a non-denominational group. There are 24 on our team. We call it the, uh, the Kairos team. And then we minister twice a year on a four-day weekend to 24 residents. We call them residents or participants. So it's, it's really a one-on-one -on -one kind of relationship. Um, a few more, few more facts. There actually no guards with us so that's can be pretty scary so we we get we were with these 24 guys uh, by ourselves without without guards now what people say well doesn't that scare you and it, it does a little bit but but i know that the guy the guys sign up for this so they're not forced to do this so they they want to do this so i always think if somebody if one of them went rogue and started to cause a problem. I really think the other 23 would, would take them down for us because they, they want the program so much. We're there uh, four days, Thursday through Sunday, 12 hour days, so it's a long, a long day. We're locked up with them for, for uh, all that time. We do uh, leave to sleep, we don't sleep there, but other than that, we're, we're there all day long. And we show our vulnerability through our testimony. A lot of our guys are, are um, our team members are alcoholics and former drug abusers. Some of them have also been incarcerated. So obviously the guys inside, they're skeptical. They don't, they're not used to people coming in and genuinely caring about them. So they, it takes a while for them to trust us. And, and by us showing our vulnerability that kind of breaks breaks down the barriers, and um, you know, many of us say through the grace of God, we would we would be there instead of them. I mean, I um, I've driven drunk way too often, and through the grace of God, uh, nothing's ever happened, and that's that's uh, through through God's help, not not anything I did. Another Greek word is uh, agape. So again, the Greeks have, you know, five or six words for everything. So Greeks, I think, have seven words for, for love. Um, philia is one. It's like a, a friendship kind of love where you can love, love one of your friends. Um, eros is kind of intimate, married love. Uh, there's storgia, which is family love. But agape is the highest form of love in the Greek language. And it's it's selfless love, um, 
And it's, it's centered on other people, not yourself. So that's called agape. And, and we have four or five forms of agape when we go in there. One is um, we actually write letters to every one of the participants. So I'll write 24 letters. And, um, and this is before we really got to know them. So what, what I do, my, I always focus on a piece of scripture, my letter. I love the prodigal son. It's probably my favorite, favorite uh, verse in the uh, gospel in the Bible. And so I always write about the prodigal son. And then some of my other favorite ones, I love the lady that gives her last coin. And there are many, many of those. And that's how I focus my letters. And uh, so but we write 24 of them. you got to remember, these guys don't get any mail. So they get, many of them don't get anything from anybody. But the ones that do, the, their mail goes to Florida, it gets scanned, and then they get to see it on a, on a, uh, on a laptop. And they, the prison lets us, because they trust us, they let us send in sealed letters, which the guys can open. So many of them have never gotten a letter in their lives. And all of a sudden, they're getting 24, they're actually opening them. <clears throat> The letters are showing uh, love and compassion, and um, it brings many of them to tears. It, it affects them so deeply. <coughs> Another, uh, I'm gonna get a drink of coffee real quick. Another uh, thing we do is a prayer chain. So we'll have uh, we'll have people, uh, often school age kids, just writing on a little little slip of construction paper, just their first name and, and their age, and uh, and then we have adults do it too. But we'll take those strips of paper and we'll make a prayer chain out of them. And in this prayer chain, we'll wrap around the room that we're in with them two or three times, and they they see this, and it just, um, again, brings them, brings them to tears because they're not used to people caring about them and, and loving them. So know that, <clears throat> I'm gonna try the water. I probably will cry when I'm talking, but I'm, I'm not crying yet. <laughs> so, uh, One of the guys talking about the prayer chain, the prayer chain had kind of drooped over the doorway where everybody walks in and out. And, and the, uh, one of the residents looked at it and goes, that's keeping the devil out of this room. And, and I think that was a, a, neat, a neat way to look at it. We also have placemats. So young people will make, make placemats for, for their table or we're staying and, and eating all day, and they'll get, you know, 30 or 40, 40 placemats each. And so there's all this agape, and, it, and it's really, really powerful to see, because they're just, they never see it. So another uh, sort of uh, mechanical thing about how it works, so we, we have discussion groups, so there'll be nine people at a table, we'll have four tables, of nine, six, six of them and three of us at each table. So the rest of our team is doing other things like food preparation and we have a little chapel in there. And so we all have various jobs, but at the table it's three of us and six of them. And, and again, after one of our talks about vulnerability, um, they will, they'll want to then have a discussion. They'll discuss the talk and then they'll, they'll make a poster uh, about kind of what they what they heard in, in the talk. And then they'll present these posters. So it's an opportunity. I mean, some of these guys, you know, maybe weren't great students, and uh, many of them aren't very good artists, but uh, many of them aren't great students. Some of them can't read. And but they'll they'll you see their confidence grow when they're presenting these these posters to the other the other tables. 
And it's really, really nice to see uh, a guy that's probably never gotten many compliments his whole life just being, being grateful for that opportunity. And our job is to be facilitators. So we have a, a saying in Cairo, it's called listen, listen, love, love. So we're successful if we don't do a ton of talking and do mostly listening. So that's, that's like any relationship we have. I mean, there's nothing more loving we can do than, than listen and not judge and not, not even have a solution. So that might be a difference in the genders. You know, I, I know with my wife, sometimes whenever she'd say something, I would try to solve it. And, and she would say, Jeff, just, just listen. You don't, have, you don't have to solve everything. So I think that's a can be a, a gender difference. Um, a few more, a few more stories about the, the Kairos weekend. So one story I always like to tell, um, we do a we try to do a good job of really making the tables diverse. So um, again, it's probably roughly half African American, half Caucasian. The the African Americans Oftentimes, uh, we're in a, a Muslim gang. It's just the way it is. You gotta survive in there. So, uh, and then the, the some of the Caucasians that we've had, we've had skinheads in the Aryan Aryan gangs. And so, we'll intentionally put a Muslim next to an Aryan. And um, so, day one, you know, there's there's a lot of tension on. On Thursday, but by Sunday, these guys, this this, this black Muslim and this white um, Aryan, will cry and hug each other by by Sunday. So it's really a powerful transformation. Uh, one of these Aryan guys, no, no, never any. I'll never mention any names, but he he came. He had a long beard, bald head, and he had two swastikas tattooed into his forehead. And so, you know, and he was big, he was 6'4", six, six, 275, a very intimidating guy. And um, he sat down and he, he fought us for four days. I mean, he just, everything we said, he, he came back with a, a retort that wasn't nice. He said he worshipped the Norse god of war. So a lot of Aryans, I don't know why, but they seem to like uh, Norse gods. And so that's what he said. And and um, by every every night, so there were, again three three nights in four days. Every night I would pray that he came back. I wasn't sure he was going to come back the next day. And by 9 a.m. the next day, I wish he hadn't. Because <laughs> he, was, he was just tough. It just wore us out. And even Sunday, when we left, he still was pushing back. But then, so we have a closing ceremony, and the alumni of the Kairos program come to a closing ceremony. So the next closing ceremony, I look out into the alumni group, and this, this guy was praising Jesus. He was singing, raising his hands, had a big smile on his face. So, you know, that's an example of Kairos time. You know, it's, we, I couldn't imagine this guy would ever love Jesus Christ. And uh, it's one of the biggest miracles I've ever witnessed, to be honest. Another guy, and tell me when I need to, am I just still have a few minutes? Okay. Um, another guy, one of these placemats had a rainbow on it, and he said he wasn't sure he was going to come back. He had, he had this rainbow placemat, but he said, I don't know if I'm going to come back. And he, he looked out his small window, these windows are so small enough he can't get through them, and he looked out and saw a rainbow. And came back uh, after that, so that was that's a cool story. Um, last time, last 
fall when it, last October, um, one of the guys gets up and he says, this is on Sunday on the last day, he says, you guys saved my life. And what, what do you mean? He says, I was going to commit suicide next week. So just a, a couple more things. I, I probably got maybe five more minutes. But I also do uh, solitary confinement rounds. So I, there, I probably go to 60 cells on a, on a Tuesday and just talk, talk to those guys in solitary. And, you know, it's, they're there, they're in that six by 12 cell with a cellmate 23 hours a day. Can you imagine that? They're, they're um, cooped up. You can hardly move in there. And they're there, they get to go out one hour a day just to, they don't even necessarily get to go outside. They just get to not be in the cell. There's a, a metal toilet in the center of the cell. And um, just so they're obviously going to the bathroom in front of their cellmate. And it's, uh, yeah, again, I don't need to describe that anymore. But they're so grateful to see you, you know, and, and, and it can it be scary. So you, you walk up to the cell, and it's a metal door, but it's got a little, little window. And usually they're so excited that you're coming. I'll walk up to the next window, and there'll be a face, <laughs> there'll be a face just staring at me. And, and you know, I, these, some of these faces are, are pretty scary, but within five seconds, they're just so grateful to have another human being treating them respectfully. And, uh, and they'll often ask for a prayer. So I've gotten a little better in my contemporary praying because uh, you have to, you know, you listen to what they want. They're usually praying for a family member. And, uh, and, and so you, you just go with it. But it's, you know, it's Matthew, um, Chapter 25, verse 36, you know, Jesus asked, did you visit me in prison? And that's unconditional love. And that's probably the hardest version of what I do is the solitary rounds. And it's just exhausting. But I, I see Jesus. I see Jesus in their eyes. I really do. So all this stuff so far has been non-denominational. On Tuesdays, we have sort of a Catholic day. So we, we do a mass inside the prison and, uh, and actually an RCIA service. So we, uh, we've had Bishop Ribatuso come down there and um, I was telling Father Mark, uh, Father Keller from Assumption comes down and Father Tony Davo and uh, various, uh, many other priests uh, come down and, and, and do this uh, Tuesday mass. And it's just, it's just so inspiring. There are about 30 of them attend. And some of these, you know, guys, like I said, they've been in there 50, 60 years, and these are they're old men. And during the and there's no kneelers, right? It's just a room with chairs. And these these 60, 70 year old men during the Eucharistic prayer and after communion will get down on their knees on the ground and, and pray really cool to see. And then we, we have a, a Christmas banquet where uh, we bring in a bunch of food and, and they, they really enjoy that. And, and again, the uh, assumption kind of, kind of puts that on. And that is, the food is kind of one of the hooks for our Kairos program. We, we feed them for four days and we, we make sure we bring in a lot of fresh vegetables and fresh fruit. And it's not like our kids, you know. They, these guys <laughs> these guys go straight straight for the fruit and vegetables. And, um, and we bring the hard-boiled eggs. They don't get eggs, or they get powdered eggs or some garbage. And so we bring the hard-boiled eggs. And some of these guys, it's like uh, one of my uncle's favorite movies, I think, is Cool Hand Luke. And so I'll see these, these guys eating a dozen eggs. It's like, slow down, guys. Hey. Your, your cellmate's going to suffer. Um, so, so the last thing I really, I, I hope I give you a, five. 
Okay, okay, a um, couple more. So I, I did want to talk about the morality of the death penalty, so I, I hope I've given you a flavor for, for kind of what, how, how, how it is in there. But I, I wanted to give you seven reasons why we should have a death penalty. And, and again, I, I want to be clear that I'm not saying these guys should be out. I'm saying uh, they shouldn't be killed. And, um, and some of them should be out, but for the most part, they've done a, a, a horrible thing. So I'm not justifying at all what, what they've done. I'm just saying, let's not kill them. Because Catholics should always be for, uh, for life, right? Whether it's the unborn, whether it's the end of life. Uh, and this is just one of those things. If we should always stand for life. Also, it seems a little counterintuitive for, to say to someone, killing is wrong. You killed someone, so I'm going to kill you. I mean, it just doesn't, doesn't make a lot of logical sense. It's much more expensive uh, to have a death penalty because of the appeals process. So a lot of these guys will be on death row for a dozen years and have many appeals, so it's it's actually more expensive to have a death penalty than, than not. And then, you know, life without parole is not a cakewalk. I mean, it's not, in some ways, it's harder than maybe put them to death. I mean, so you've gotten a flavor for how they have to live. So it's, it's not easy to be life without parole. I think victims, and this is, you know, something I can't prove, but I think victims of crimes really can only get peace through forgiveness. And, and that's obviously very difficult for somebody that's done something horrible to, to your family. But I know, I, I've never heard a story where somebody witnessed an execution and, um, and then felt, felt great about it. I mean, the only way you can get peace is for forgiveness, and I believe that in my heart. We're also giving people a chance to save their souls. You know, they, they were young and, and dumb when they did their crime, but 30 years later, Cairo's time, maybe they could find Jesus, and they have uh, eternity with, with God, because we've given them that opportunity to do that 30 years later. And the last, is this is just a question, the last thing, and then I'll, I'll turn it over for questions, but how many people, how many innocent people would all of you justify killing uh, in, the, in the death penalty? How many innocent people? Most people would say, well, one's too many. But it's been proven by the Innocence Project that we've probably killed 60 innocent people. We've exonerated 200 that got out of jail because of DNA testing or whatever. So we, it's, there's no question that we have and will continue to kill innocent people. And how, how many is too many? I, I would say one. And Missouri is third, kills, Missouri executes the third most of any state. It's only, only five states executed people last year, and we were, we were third only. Uh, third to Florida and Texas. So that, that's not, we got a lot of bad stats in St. Louis and Missouri, and that's, that's another one you can add to the list, in my opinion. I, I uh, got to be friends with a guy that was executed last year. His name was Leonard Taylor um, Rahim, and uh, it was awful. I mean, to see a friend die, Okay, we'll leave it, leave it on high uh, <laughs> So I, I am uh, running out of time here, so I'd love to, love to hear any questions. Anybody has? Why don't they let them have fruits and vegetables? Because they're expensive. So it's, it's, a, it's a budgetary thing. I mean, they'll, they'll do as little as they can to save money. It's as simple as that. Since you serve men, is your whole team on Kairos all men as well? Thank you. Uh, we, 
the, the guys, the team members that go in are all men. They have to be, that's a prison rule. But we do have a, a female support team that we have uh, two months of preparation before we go in there as a team. We want everybody to feel like we know each other and we love each other as a team. So the support team uh, is praying for us. They help with food during the preparation meeting. They will go down to Potosi and pray while we're, or they, oh, still there. So uh, does that answer your question? Okay. Anybody else? That is true, uh, but it is, certainly it's true in solitary. They can't have anything in solitary confinement. In fact, uh, sometimes if they think they're suicidal, they'll strip them naked and just have them in their cell naked. So solitary, no rosaries. They may be able to have a rosary. There are two houses, two of the six houses are uh, good behavior, and uh, they might be able to have a rosary in in the five or six house, but definitely not in, in solitary. What does it say about Matthew? Matthew 25, 36. It, it's that the part where he's, you know, did, did you visit the poor? Did you visit the sick? And it, it says basically, did you visit me while I was in prison? So it's chapter 25, verse 36. Yes, that's the right one. So, in 36, I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. You will observe me. Anybody else? I'll try to do as many as I can, but they kick me out. I just want to say thank you for talking with us and. Um, for those of you that can't quite go the step that you go, Jeff, which I commend, uh, Criminal Justice Ministry also has a pen pal program, and that really changed my life because I did develop a relationship, and the laws changed uh, several years ago for those that were um, younger than 18, that they no longer had to serve a life prison. They still had to go through years of parole, um, and it took several years for the individual I was uh, in writing with to be released, but in 2020, during the, uh, or 2021, the meet was um, given parole in uh, August of 2020 and was released in February of 21. He is um, still, we're still close, I, but he doesn't need me. We don't have that same relationship because he is now in the community, serving the community, working, and has developed relationships with uh, some who have been in prison with him and the individual who employs many of these prisoners really helped them. And so, given a second chance, what I learned from him, and Father Paul, I really listened to what you said, I don't know if you're still here, um, that was I doing it for me, but I got a lot out of it. So what I learned was the hope and the faith that if you're in prison 30 years, that you have to maintain and that relationship with Christ really changed him, not necessarily through me, all I think I gave him was someone believed in him and that there is a chance for, for um, becoming back into society. So thank you, though, for actually doing the visit. Thank you for what you do also. I also was going to ask if there was a pen pal program that uh, and who you would contact uh, if you were interested in maybe writing some of the inmates. Uh, but I'm wondering too, if there's anything else that can be donated to them? Uh, would it be allowed magazines or uh, subscription to magazines or anything like that? Uh, that, you know, if they could be delivered uh, to the prison. So thank, thank you for that. And, and I, would, I would work through criminal justice ministry on, on the Pen Pell program. Um, we, we can't do letters in my Kairos program, but C, they call it CGM, our criminal justice ministry, is, is a great way to do that. As far as um, bringing stuff in, when, when I did solitary rounds, we used to be able to bring in 
material, but in the wisdom of, of the prison. So they have many overdoses out there. Uh, fentanyl is, is, a, is a terrible problem. And so who do they look to? Uh, they, they, made, they told us we couldn't bring stuff in anymore. So obviously we're not bringing in drugs. But um, they're looking for a scapegoat, so we can't bring anything in to solitary right, right now. And we, they used to really like that, because they had some in their cell to, to read. So hopefully that'll change. And I'll, I'll try not to get in the commentary about how the drugs get in there. But um, we can't, can't write it down. Anybody else? Looks like I'm getting the hook here. for spending this morning with us. I'm sure I speak for everybody when I say that it's extremely enlightening, humbling, and uh, pretty amazing what you do. So thank you. There's a few uh, donuts left if you want to grab one on your way out, but otherwise we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Stay tuned to the bulletin next month. Sorry. <laughs> thank you, Annie. Thanks a lot, everybody. If anybody's not going to Mass and hasn't had a question, I can stick around for a few minutes.